Welcome to the St John's College webinar series. This is the second session, the student Q&A. Um, I'm really excited for this session. It's an excellent one. I'm going to, well, first of all, introduce myself. I'm Elsie. I work here in um, St John's College in the admissions office as the school's liaison and access officer. And I am so delighted to be joined this evening by five of our amazing current St John's students. So I'm going to pass over to them now to introduce themselves, and then we'll get going with some questions. Amir, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amir. Uh, I'm a second year student at John's. I study Komsky, which is short for computer science. Uh, and my one of the hobbies that I do is playing squash at John's. We actually have our own squash course, so it's, it's really good to like start your day uh, with a game of a squash. Fantastic. Thank you. Emily, would you like to go next? So hi, I'm Emily. I'm a fourth year student here at John's and I'm a medical student. Um, I have many hobbies, um, but I particularly enjoy sport both in college and out of college. Fantastic, thank you, Emily. Alex. Hi everyone, uh, yeah, I'm Alex. Um, I'm a second year undergrad architecture student. Um, I do the stereotypical Cambridge thing of rowing um, for um, college, and I also do college hockey, so yeah. Fantastic. Um, welcome, Richard. Hi, sorry, we just got started with introductions. Um, Sarah, would you like to go next? Yep, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a third year theology student. Uh, outside a degree, I write for Varsity, which is Cambridge student newspaper, and I've been involved with JCR staff, which is the student union we have at each college in Cambridge. Amazing. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Michael, would you like to go next? Hi, everyone. My name is Michael. Um, I'm a first year studying HSVS, which stands for Human, Social and Political Sciences. Um, one hobby that I have is I like to DJ, but yeah, like um, Emily, I have lots of different hobbies too. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Great fact. Um, welcome, Richard. Would you like to introduce yourself, what course you're studying and what year you're in for the attendees? Uh, hi, I'm Richard. I'm a first year uh, doing natural sciences. Uh, I do physics, chemistry, biology and maths B, so like basically across the board, um, most of the sciences uh, outside of the degree. Um, I, I'm, I'm JCR Access Officer and uh, I row occasionally. <laughs> Fantastic. We have such all-rounders this evening. That's excellent. Um, great. Okay, so I'm going to get started with some questions about the application process itself. So first of all, I want to pose to all of the current students here on the panel, how did you find applying to university in general and maybe framing it in uh, what advice would you give your past applicant self? Um, who would like to go first with this question? I don't mind going first. Great. <laughs> um, so if I look back, I actually found it quite a stressful time. I just think because you're balancing a lot of things, A-levels, extracurriculars, um, applications, but it definitely doesn't have to be as stressful as that. Um, so perhaps one thing I would recommend is getting started on your personal statement early, um, trying to get a draft of that done, maybe like beginning of um, year 12, something like that. Um, no, year 13, whenever you apply. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, getting that done quickly so that you can have time to redraft it, look at it and get advice from teachers and things like that. Um, also, my main piece of advice is more just like go with your gut. So if you're maybe thinking between two subjects, um, not sure what to put for your firm and insurance, um, just go with your instinct, I think, because it is a personal application and while getting advice is good, at the end of the day, you're gonna be the one studying the subject. So you wanna make sure that you're yeah committed to that and it's what you really want to do. So I think those are my two bits of advice. Excellent, Sarah. Yeah, absolutely agree. Subject choice is really key. And starting early with that application prep, personal statement prep, what we like to call uh, super curriculars or supra curriculars, engaging with your subject is really key because it helps you um, pick your subject. Um, excellent. Emily, would you like to go next and reflect on your experience? 
Uh, yeah. Um, so for medicine, there's like a lot of hoops you have to jump through. So um, it was understandably very stressful, as Sarah said. Um, but just kind of when you talk about the supercurriculars, for example, just doing the stuff that you actually really enjoy, because when you do talk about it interview, for example, it comes across a lot better if you genuinely have enjoyed it or you have an interest in it. So doing it for the sake of doing it, I wouldn't necessarily do do it because it entices you, it excites you. Um, so yeah, that would be my recommendation. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to get up just in the background and pop it in the chat, the supercurricular suggestions document, which really does emphasize exactly what Emily's just said. They've got lots of suggestions there split by course. Um, so you can sort of search for your relevant subject areas. And then it's all divided up by, um, by like type of media. So you've got podcasts, you've got articles, um, you've got documentaries, books, um, all sorts of resources basically. Um, and a lot of them are just completely free to access if you've got access to the internet. Uh, so that's a really, really good advice. Um, thank you, Emily. Did anyone else have any reflections sort of generally about the application process and maybe what they would want to tell their applicant self if they could? Yeah, go on, Amir. Um, yeah, I would probably say, I mean, um, as everyone said, it, it, it's, it is a quite a stressful time, but I would probably say just try and enjoy it. Uh, I mean, like every part of the application process, like the uh, Cambridge interview and like every part of it is kind of like an experience of how it's like to study here. Like even the interview is kind of like basically like a supervision. You're just sitting there like uh, going through a problem with someone who's really good at that topic. So it's, uh, I think, yeah, just try and enjoy it. And I know it's going to be a stressful, but uh, yeah. No, fantastic. Um, completely agree. I popped in the chat there the, the full uh, web page on supercurriculars from the main university. And that has linked in there the supercurricular suggestions document and also um, HE Plus, which is another similar resource hub um, and really great split by subject. It's got some guided um, activities and resources for you to work through. Um, so yeah, ha definitely have a look. Um, I saw another hand, another Zoom hand pop up. Um, did anyone else have anything? Oh, perfect, Alex. Off you go. Yeah, yeah. that was me. Sorry. Um, another thing I thought is worth mentioning is a big part of applications to Cambridge and Oxford is also colleges. Um, obviously, you're all wanting to apply to St. John's because it's the best college. Um, but yeah, it's well worth looking at uh, the 31 different colleges because some will do certain subjects some won't um so it's that's a good thing to look at the comparing what course you're wanting to study your college maybe the proximity to your department and who your director of studies uh, would be potentially so yeah it's well worth looking at the range of factors um when considering your application Absolutely excellent. Yeah, thank you, Alex. I've popped in the chat there the um, the guide to choosing a college, which has some really useful, there's a video at the top and then also some useful um, paragraphs beneath. So definitely have a look at that um, in your in your free time and, and, and definitely also check that the colleges uh, offer the course that, that you want to study. Um, so at St. John's, we offer all 30 undergraduate courses, um, but some colleges don't have capacity to offer certain courses. So that's a really good point. Thank you, Alex. Yes, Richard. Uh, just to add to what Alex uh, said, when it comes to choosing a college, if you um, need financial support, different colleges offer different levels of financial support. So you might want to look into which ones will meet the level that you need to you know, live comfortably when you're here. So just keep that in mind, basically. Yeah. Fantastic, Richard. Thank you so much. That's a really important factor um, for applicants to consider. I will find the financial support information. There's a few pages that I want to share, um, both the main university uh, scheme of financial support, which is the Cambridge Bursary Scheme, and then also I'll link, as an example, the St John's College Finance and Support uh, web pages and our grants and scholarships. Um, so I'll, I'll link those in just a moment. We also have another question that's kind of about the application process, but thinking about it from the other end. So post application and even post uh, getting an offer, a, a really important sort of question to think about at any stage, I think, um, in sort of thinking about the application journey broadly. How did you all find the process of meeting your offer to study here? Um, and do talk about if, if you're happy talking about sort of, you know, um, if you had a conditional offer, um, if you were part of the August reconsideration pool, I think it'd be really useful to sort of hear your experiences of, of, of meeting your offer to come study here. 
Um, who hasn't answered yet? Who wants to go? Sorry, I've lost track of who's spoken. Uh, I'll go first. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so for um, HSPS, the offer is A star AA. Um, and I did receive an offer in January. So it was kind of just about actually getting the A star AA. Um, for me personally, um, because I did humanities subjects, I did history, politics, and geography for A level. It was mainly sort of about like, revising in a way where I'm trying to not just learn knowledge, but learn knowledge in a specific way to answer questions. So I did quite a lot of like essay plans um, and like read a lot of essay plans because fair enough, like you can know the knowledge, but if you can't apply that to an exam question or if you can't actually answer an essay in the correct way, then there's no point of you knowing all that knowledge. But um, I would definitely say spread out your work. Don't try and like rush in the last month before A-levels. Um, if you do have mock exams in March, use that as like a really good practice for your A-levels because if you take it very seriously, it does help in the long run because at least you know where you really are and at least you can kind of see what a full A-level will look like. Um, yeah, I would definitely say spread it out. In like an average day, I would probably revise at least two hours. And sometimes it's not like just sitting down reading a book or writing an essay. Sometimes it's watching a video and just making sure that I can recap that information or just looking at a question and making sure that I know how to answer this or using my teachers and giving them essays that I've written so that they can mark it, so that they can make sure that it's to a good standard. So I would definitely say use as much time as you can. As soon as you get the offer in January, just work towards getting the offer and make sure you space out enough time so you don't have to rush at the end but that's what i would say fantastic michael that was so comprehensive thank you so much yeah just to pick up on something you've mentioned um using the resources that are available to you absolutely and I think this is often the advice we say for admissions tests as well you know the, the sample papers the practice papers are there and it's having that practice and varying how you practice as well, um, you know, under time conditions, but then trying to solve the problems or analyzing the text or something in a group, in a small group with your peers. I, I think I really like that advice about sort of mixing it up. Um, definitely not what I did. I used to just be like nose in a book thinking that the information will come by osmosis into my head. Um, so yeah, excellent advice. Did anyone else have any reflections on um, meeting your offer? Uh, try and find a place like that's comfortable for you to work in. Um, so for me, I lived near a uh, uni um, in Keele Uni, where I was by, by where I was a bus ride away, and they had their library open, and so I could go there and I'd use their library to revise. Um, and just try and find a place where you can kind of zone everything else out and work. And, you know, with time constraints, you probably some a lot of people will be working part time jobs and trying to make ends meet. You just have to kind of get what you can do if that means I remember I was working some shifts and I'd have my flashcards off to the side and I got in trouble a few times for that. Um, you just have to make things work really and make the ends meet and get it done, you know, and you, you can only try really. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you, Richard. Yeah, having that motivation as well, I, I would imagine was 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 quite a useful um, thing to have. That sort of like goal that you're you're working towards. Yes, Emily, what would you like to add? Oh, I think Emily, uh, her video is frozen. Oh, you you're back. Sorry, go on, Emily. Yeah, sorry, that was my internet. Um, so I was just gonna say, um, there were really really good points that have been made, but for me, I found that actually getting the offer quite daunting because it's something you have to achieve. So the way that I kind of thought about it was aiming for the grades that I knew would make me happy, regardless of the offer that I'd been given. Um, so my offer was A star AA as well. Um, but I knew that I realistically wanted to get all A stars. So that's what I worked for. Um, and I think that helped a lot with my motivation and also not like thinking about the offer, like looming over you um, really was really helpful. Excellent. Yeah, reframing it is, is always a useful technique, isn't it? Yes, Amir, thank you. What do you have to add? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, that, well, my application process was a bit different to everybody else. Uh, I didn't actually get an offer, so I had my interviews and uh, I I got a rejection letter, but so I, I wasn't offered a place. But uh, then I was actually uh, pulled again in summer. So I think they call it the August reconsideration pool. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I see. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, just I, I, I had been told that uh, this process is going on. So even if you don't get an offer, 
you can still work hard so you get the grades that would would have got you into Cambridge. Uh, so that's probably something you, you might want to consider uh, if you didn't get in uh, or if you didn't get an offer in January, uh, you can still work, uh, work towards the grades. Uh, that's like Cambridge grades. If you look them up on the uh, department website for whichever subject that you're applying for. And uh, I did get the grades that I needed and I, I, I filled in the form and it, it was exactly the same day as uh, the results day. Uh, I filled I filled in a form online and uh, I got a call from the from St John's the same day and they said that uh, I've, I've been offered a place. So yeah, just uh, even if you don't get in in January, there's always time. Just um, you just yeah, just just work for the grades and that's that's also another possibility. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Amir. For more information about um, the August re reconsideration pool, just have a look at the link it, that I've put in the chat. And I've also put just above it, um, I found the pages on financial support, both from Central University and also from St. John's as an example of what a college offers students. Excellent. Um, OK, I think we'll move on to the next sort of topic area for this evening session, um, which is extracurricular societies, and other opportunities that are available to you outside of your studies, your, your tripos, your course, as we call it here in Cambridge. Um, so who wants to who wants to start with this one? I, I can't remember now who did DJing and who did rowing. And <laughs> but um, yeah, just jump in, guys, and let us know what sort of extracurriculars you have um, got up to while you've been a student here so far. Yeah, off you go, Alex. Um, hi, everyone. So when I came to Cambridge, I... Uh, used to play hockey beforehand um, and I've continued that uh, playing for the college. We have an inter-college sort of hockey league where um, every Sunday we have games, Saturday training and then Wednesday evenings uh, have um, training again. Um, it's sort of very, you can work it around your work, um, it's pretty adaptable, um, Good. it's a good way to meet everyone in the college around, uh, around you. Um, and so you have socials as well, get to know everyone really well. Uh, and then and I started rowing, I learned to row um, here in my first year. Um, and uh, we've got a very good rowing club, the Lady Margaret Oak Club, um, uh, where we have uh, every year four men's boats and four women's boats. And then in the first term, we also have a very comprehensive like novice program. Uh, so I was lower boat captain and sort of looked after the men's side on that this year. Um, yeah, so we will basically, the majority of people who come to Cambridge have never rode before. And there's a lot of people that like trying it. So we have a massive program for teaching everyone how to row, get involved. Richard was one of my novices this year. Um, he's now rowing M3. So um, yeah, it's, it's one of those great things that you get to experience completely free of cost. It's one of those, it's, it's a Cambridge thing. It's one of those great opportunities you have here. And I'd highly encourage people to get involved with everything, where whichever university you end up at. Fantastic. Anything else from anyone on other opportunities? Yes, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, so I talked a bit about being on JCR, which is basically a little student union committee that all the different colleges at Cambridge have. And the role of a JCR is basically to work with college to make life at John's as good as it can be for students so um yeah Rich has just been elected access officer and we have welfare officers and we also have um entertainment officers who throw parties in college for students so that's a really good way to kind of get involved in the life of the college um so I was secretary in my first and second year and co-president with my friend last year and that just like taught me a lot about managing time, about organizing events, working in a committee. So I'd highly recommend. Um, and also the art scene at Cambridge is super cool. There's so much going on. Um, so last year I did a magazine called Bait. So we'd publish poetry, art, prose from students in Cambridge and beyond. And um, we'd host launch events at college bars and in and around Cambridge. And that was also a really cool experience. And you just meet loads of people being really creative, like um, 
and doing lots of stuff outside of their work because I think the stereotype of Cambridge is that everybody just does their degree and like doesn't have a social life and isn't fun but that is not the truth um there's so much going on especially like with theatre as well um you can pitch a play or an open mic night to ADC Theatre in Cambridge and it's completely student run so they, there's like a there's a show basically every week during term, multiple shows. And yeah, it's a really good opportunity if that's sort of your scene. Um, so there's something for everyone, I would say. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah for sharing that. There we go. <laughs> um, Richard, yes, do you want to um, hop in? Uh, well, something that, that in Freshers, you go to these, uh, the Freshers Fair and you basically just see all these different societies. It's just in the first few weeks because it, it the pace of the work gradually sort of picks up so you can pretty much just go to all sorts of different things so I remember I went to like a go society which is a, some random board game and it's just sort of like there's a lot of stuff you'll sign up for that you'll end up never doing again but it's just an interesting experience because there's all these different places um that are probably worth just trying because they, they're there so yeah absolutely yes Michael yeah I just wanted to add like there's so many um societies in Cambridge and a lot of them can actually help you like hone certain skills that you want to have whether they be sports skills or musical ones so like I said I like to DJ on the side um, and I had started DJing before Cambridge but when I got here obviously there's a DJ society there's a hip-hop society so I was able to kind of be around like-minded people but um, I would definitely say don't just like don't like cut yourself in a way where like there's so many different options for you to take. So you might as well take them, try as many things as you want to. So I'm also part of the Cambridge Union where I kind of practice debating and advocacy, which is something I'm interested in too. Um, like Sarah was talking about um, with ADC Theatre, I'm also part of that. And I am currently writing a play for ADC, which is completely different to what I do with the Hip Hop Society, but it allows me to basically, you know, spread my wings and I like, kind of practice whatever I want to practice. Um, and sports wise, Cambridge has a huge sports culture. Um, there are some people that take sports a little bit more seriously than others, but it's still like an amazing culture. There's so many amazing facilities. Um, I'm kind of starting to get into like powerlifting. The uni gym is literally amazing. So there's so many opportunities for you and there's so many well-funded societies and facilities for you to use. So you might as well use them. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with, with what you've both said there. The, the range of opportunities is just incredible. Speaking as someone who's no longer a student, um, it, it's it's really such a unique time for you to be able to try so many different things, things that you've never heard of, things you've never had the opportunity to try, but you have kind of heard of and thought it might be, might be something that would be up your street. So yeah, just try as much and I think it's a trial and error process isn't it of figuring out what you're going to keep up with in terms of like commitments and what level like you mentioned Michael in terms of like sport because if you want to do it more seriously it might be like a university level club um if you want to do it more casually it might be a college level club um so that's the kind of difference broadly speaking between different levels of societies um before we move on to um talking about like structuring your days and weeks in terms of your work and what you do um in addition to that in terms of your extracurriculars i just wanted to cover a few of the questions um that we've had in the q a box um we will cover others at the end but i think these are really important before we sort of um, move on I think a really good question that's come in is how did you choose between selecting Cambridge and Oxford? Um, so this is a really useful point, I think, to talk about course choice and subject choice. And we've talked generally about sort of subject, but we haven't really talked about sort of what the course itself offers you like at the Cambridge course itself. Um, so yeah, please do share your reflections on that. Alex, I saw your hand go up. Off you go. Um, yeah, so for me, I knew from the start before even looking at universities, I wanted to study architecture. Um, and I was having a look at Oxford, Cambridge, just having a look. And that's where subjects really important because Oxford, they don't offer that course whatsoever. So of course, Cambridge became the natural option and then it became into choosing which colleges to look at. Um, so any outside interests you could also look at and consider with colleges, but yeah, really short and sweet decision for me and I'm sure the others have got much longer answers <laughs> because it gets far more complicated. No it's a really good point though Alex like some you know uh, Oxford don't offer um, veterinary medicine uh, Cambridge do you know there are like some really distinct uh, 
the decision is made for you <laughs> um, in terms of like choosing between Oxford and Cambridge. Amir, um, would you like to go next? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was just going to add that, uh, well, for the sub some subjects, there's like, uh, there's always tables online where you can like uh, see which university offers a better course. And uh, but apart from that, you can always like uh, look into what the course actually consists of. So for me, between Oxford and Cambridge, I uh, I went and looked at both of the websites and uh, the department. I saw like exactly which modules they're going to be covering in the uh, first year and uh, as soon as I looked at that I, I, I knew like the Cambridge courses um, fits my interest much better so I, I, I knew uh, that would fit into my uh, yeah my, my interest so yeah excellent advice Amir like looking at the, the breakdown of detail of modules and options that you can take in either in a physical perspective or on the course page as you mentioned it's really really useful um, yeah Richard do you want to go next uh, well, with, when it comes to well, natural sciences, which is the course I do, uh, it, in Cambridge, if you're doing any uh, science course, uh, you go through Natsuki, um, and that, you know, so physics, chemistry, any other biolog biological sciences, and what that means is you don't have to make a decision straight away when you apply, you know, you, you apply as either bio Natsuki or phys Natsuki, but then when you hear this, that doesn't give you any restriction on what modules you do in the first year the modules there's some a level requirements but if you're doing science a levels of chance so you can take whichever ones you want um and that attracted me because i'm very indecisive and i even i applied here as a bio nasty but then after coming here i'm sort of swapping to physical because i prefer the process of solving math problems to like writing essays so it's you know the fact that it gives you that freedom and it allows you to kind of uh changed and mix and match stuff is what drew me to doing uh Natsuki instead of well which to, if you know what you want to do then you could go the other way and say I, you know I know I want to do physics I know I want to just do physics and so you know Oxford have a physics course um so it's really down to you to decide which one's better for you yeah absolutely Richard yeah I think Natsuki is a really good example of having that broad introduction to the like science as a discipline first of all but a lot of our courses are like that aren't they they've got that first year where it's very broad and you have some core compulsory modules that you take and then after that you almost like specialize and you take your own path picking up your options along the way and it ends up being that you've sort of tailored the course to your own interests because these courses here are really really flexible um so yeah no excellent advice absolutely Sarah do you want to go next and then uh, Michael and Emily sorry you've all got your hands up <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so for me I knew I wanted to do theology and I had a look at the Oxford website and what it offered and even though perhaps the titles of the modules look similar if you actually look into you can often get like paper descriptions that show you exactly what you're going to be studying and for me just the ones at Cambridge seemed a bit more interesting and also in terms of choice first year theology for example quite unusual but you can basically pick all the modules that you do and so I found that flexibility really appealing whereas in the Oxford course you have to do these four set modules and I was a bit like mm, I want to choose um what I want to do and that's been a really big factor in being able to as you were saying like specialize and figure out what you really enjoy and also I think the main thing is actually if both Oxford and Cambridge do the subject you want to do and maybe you're finding it a bit difficult try and visit them I think also you living seeing the city trying to imagine yourself um in one place or the other is quite a big part of it and so I went to both open days in the summer of year 12 and I just found I preferred Cambridge as a city and the college and could see myself there and visited the faculty as well uh, which is where you'd have lectures and classes and that kind of thing and yeah so Cambridge just appealed to me but it might it might be different for everybody but I think until you actually get there and I, I say like experience the vibes like it's quite hard to make a decision one way or the other so that would be my advice. Excellent thank you Sarah just on open days quickly I've popped the um, relevant uh, website page uh, in the chat. Michael would you like to go next? Uh, yeah so for me um, I had academic interests so I had specific things that I was actually interested in rather than like an actual subject so I kind of just looked at 
which degree allowed me to look at those academic interests the most. And HSBS only exists at Cambridge. It doesn't exist at Oxford. So that was one step where I was just like, okay, I'm a bit more leaning to Cambridge. Um, I thought about doing history and politics and I compared both history and politics modules to, from Oxford and Cambridge. And I just preferred the Cambridge one. Um, like Sarah said, look at what is actually entailed in the subject because the names might be the same, but then when you actually look at what's in it, it's quite different. And on visiting, um, I had visited Oxford and I realized Oxford doesn't really have like set spaces for faculty. So the faculty is kind of more like spread around everywhere. And I didn't really like that. I kind of, for some reason, wanted a set space to learn. And Cambridge, of course, has Sidrick site for humanities, which is somewhere that you can actually go to. So it's kind of just little things like that that kind of help your decision. But on subjects, there are so many subjects at Oxford, so many subjects at Cambridge. We don't offer the same things. And it's just sometimes you might not actually like the subject. It's more about academic interest within the subject. So definitely look at paper guides, look at exam questions, past exam papers to kind of gauge what the subject is really about. And that should hopefully make your decision easier. Yeah, definitely. I really like that approach, Michael. I'm going to link in the chat now. So I'm just really trying to find the url there we go um the a to z list of, uh, of of subjects and under which course they're they, they come under basically i've explained that really poorly but basically it's an a to z of subject areas so like academic interest areas like you mentioned michael and then underneath is listed which cambridge course you would be able to study and pursue that academic interest so i think that's a really useful way of of searching for courses and i know that other university uh, prospectuses and uh, websites have this sort of um search uh, function as well um so definitely have a look at it that way rather than coming from just thinking okay which subjects sound like i would be interested in them really get down into the into the detail of them excellent thank you emily yes off you go yeah so just finally i would say also have a look at how they teach um because obviously different universities teach in different ways so for medicine there's a huge range and whether it's like traditional integrated problem-based learning um so I kind of knew that I wanted to do traditional course, which is why I was leaning towards Oxford and Cambridge and other universities like Imperial. Um, but then like going into the nitty gritty, like going on the course information of both, I found out that Cambridge does dissection, whereas Oxford does something called prosection, which is not as hands on and it's just a lot more looking. Um, so that was really the thing that kind of pushed me towards Cambridge over Oxford. Um, so just kind of thinking to yourself, how would you like to be taught and which university is going to cater best to that? Definitely a really, really important thing that I just completely had forgotten to mention. So thank you so much, Emily, for raising that. Yeah, the, there's the methods of teaching and learning and how you'll be assessed. Um, really important to consider as well. Um, I will now move to a couple other questions that have popped up in the Q&A, because I think we, they're, they're really good ones. And they're about college choice and also um, how colleges work. So if I could just explain briefly the kind of idea of the collegiate university and how that works in terms of the application process. So you can um, either choose to apply to a particular college when you make your application, or you choose to make an open application, which basically means that your application will then be allocated to um, a college because it's the colleges within the University of Cambridge, which is a collegiate university, so that just means it's made up of colleges that are kind of like mini campuses within the city. And um, I'll share, if I remember, um, the map of Cambridge, which is really helpful because it sort of shows you where the departments are, where the colleges are, you can kind of get a sense, um, uh, if you haven't been here before, of how it sort of works as a collegiate university. Um, but yeah, essentially, the colleges are the institutions that admit students, so hence why I um, work here in the admissions office in St John's College, so it's the colleges that assess applicants. So we assess applicants um, but the crucial thing to say is that if you apply directly or if you apply apply via an open application and then get allocated to us in whichever college we are in or my equivalent in other colleges, um, that's not going to be an advantage or a disadvantage to you. So college choice is really something that you should see as a, as a personal choice and not as one that's going to sort of um, increase your chances of getting a place, getting an offer. Um, it's a really common myth to think that applying to certain colleges, to certain subjects, um, or certain colleges are better for certain subjects. 
the, the one thing to note is what I said at the start is that some colleges uh, just don't offer certain courses. That does change year to year. I know that there are colleges considering uh, you know, each year which courses they have capacity to, uh, to offer, how many places indeed for each course and things like that. So that does vary by college, by year. Um, so do just keep uh, keep an eye on the website um, for those sort of updates, uh, those details. But yeah, so it's not going to uh, disadvantage or advantage you either way. Um, we would much rather, you know, I'm speaking from the perspective of working in the admissions office here in St. John's, we'd much rather take um, a candidate, whether they apply to us directly or, or not, or whether they were in the pool system, which is something I'll talk about in just a second. Um, it's not, that's not going to be a factor whether you sort of chose us or not. Um, so in terms of the pool system, the winter pool system, that's something I just mentioned, and I want to just briefly explain. It's a metaphorical pool. Um, and basically what it is, is I'll, I'll put a, a link in the chat so you can read about about it more um, later. Um, the winter pool is uh, how colleges sort of speak to each other and um, and share applicants and, and things like that. So basically, if one college for one particular subject in one year um, has loads of really strong applicants, but we only have so many places, so each college only has so many um, offers that it can make, so many students that they that can study that course at that college. Um, but it happens every year and there's no rhyme or reason really why, you know, some colleges for some courses get loads of applicants in one particular course and then they're lacking applicants in another. So the pool system, the winter pool systems help sort of even that out. So basically colleges will put into the pool, put forward for other colleges consideration, strong applicants for whatever course it is that they would like um, to be considered for a place. So applicants that they think would thrive at Cambridge generally at any college, um, but at St. John's, for instance, or whichever other college, they just don't have um, a place for. So that's how the winter pool system works broadly. So that, that's basically the system that ensures that um, one college doesn't get loads of applicants one year and another college is left uh, without any, you know, or without any students. And that's how it sort of works to even itself out. Um, so I hope that answers those two questions. Um, briefly, if I may as well, um, answer about a gap year. Um, so we're completely neutral with regards to gap years. There's no sort of bias either way. Um, gap years are something that some students uh, want to do. They want to improve their skills. They want to um, do an internship. They want to travel, earn money. Um, it, lots of different reasons. I think it's around five or six percent of students, like uh, Cambridge students overall, not St John's specific statistic there, who have taken a gap year. Um, the only thing that we do ask you to be certain about with us in terms of gap years is um, we want you to have a firm commitment on your entry year, so when you would be wanting to start your um, your course, so you need to state on your, your application if you would like to defer your entry, i.e. if you would be um, taking a gap year, and your plans for your gap year and what you have, um, uh, you know, planned for for that year would be something that you could discuss in your interview so it might be something that's relevant to you but I um, just wanted to say at this point that it's not going to sort of um, advantage or disadvantage you if you do choose to take one. Um, I think that's a good point for me to ask some of the questions that have come in specifically for um, two courses in particular. I saw one about HSPS. Oh did you it's moved out now. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. You've answered that in the Q&A box. That's super helpful. Um, that will allow us, I think, to, um, to move to another question I wanted to cover. I just saw it. Oh, yes, the Cambridge Medicine course. Um, so how has the Cambridge Medicine course been as an experience to you so far? Um, so Emily, do you want to sort of talk a little bit about your experience of doing medicine? You're in fourth year, right? So you've had your intercalation of third year. Do you want to maybe talk a bit about about that yeah so I'm in fourth year now so I've completed the preclinical course which is the first two years um they are very lecture intensive as most of Cambridge courses are and also practical intensive but the information you learn is all very interesting um, but it's at a very high level and then the intercalation year is my third year and another reason I chose Cambridge specifically is that you can essentially do any course as long as you say there's a good reason about why this is going to improve you as a person or be relevant to medicine so I myself did zoology, I have a friend that did um, HSPS, somebody else did philosophy, so it's kind of you can just do another course in Cambridge just for that year, which is really great, um, and at the end of that I'll get, I've got a natural sciences degree, so I graduated in summer, 
And then what happens is because you just essentially move straight into clinical medicine, which is based in Allenbrooks and hospitals around Cambridge. Um, so regarding the question, uh, medicine is very social. You meet a lot of people at the lectures and in clinical school because a lot of us were on Zoom um, and pre-recorded because of COVID. It was actually really lovely because you got to meet people kind of for the first time because we haven't met them because of the like breakdown in COVID. Um, it is hard academically, but you don't get in unless you can do it. So like you are prepared and there's a lot of support in terms of like supervisions and pastoral support if you are struggling and you kind of do group together and like have study sessions, that kind of thing to help you through it. And the resources they give you are really great. Um, and academically social experiences. So kind of, I think that means like competitions and like extracurriculars regarding the academics. So there's societies, there's lots of medical societies, but there's also societies like as Sarah was saying that if you're not particularly interested in your subject or you want to do something else. Um, so there's just lots of experience for growth, um, I would say. And I've really enjoyed studying and I've still got two and a half years left. So I won't be going anywhere anyway, anytime soon. Thanks, Emily. That was really, really helpful. Um, I've seen a question come in which nicely segues into my um, next to next topic, which is about St John's itself, like about the college, the community, um, food, accommodation, uh, everything really about the college, any facilities that, um, that you've enjoyed so far as, as being a student here. The question itself was, um, I think, how, why did you, yeah, what made all of you want to study at St John's? So um, does anyone want to reflect on their experience of being a St John's student? Um, yes, yeah, so the reason I chose St John's is I did a big um, circle around department of how close uh, all the colleges were because I didn't want to walk miles for, um, and you, it's very easy to get around Cambridge if you have a bike, you can get to any point in Cambridge in 20 minutes on a bike, uh, it's a very accessible small city. Um, but I also looked at the extracurriculars because all colleges have societies and um, sports and everything going on, but some offer a bigger range than others. So I looked at um, what I was interested in as hockey and art societies. And John's was really strong. It has a big range of those as one of the bigger colleges. Um, and also the sort of support it offers. So there's uh, different grants for learning and research, uh, materials. Um, so it, that's also good to look at bursaries and uh, what's available there as well. Um, also, it's if you can, come and visit on uh, some of the open days because it's really great to get a feel for the different colleges. Um, it's uh, so like John's has uh, recently opened a new buttery cafe bar space um, have a look on the website on that it's been all over the place uh, really exciting and nice so um, it's also the spaces they offer so rooms you can book out music rooms um, art rooms uh, library spaces um, yeah have a look at the different colleges because they all have a wide range of different things like some colleges um, have like a pool for during summer uh, which is kind of crazy to think about and others you have the sports field say at John's straight across the road with an astroturf which is really great um, yeah so there's a whole range of different uh, things to look at from purely academic uh, all the way to your social experience because your college is basically like your home when you're at university um, and everyone in your college, you'll come to know so many people that don't do your degree who you would not know uh, if you were not in the same college as them. And they become sort of this family around you. So it's really great to sort of find a college that, um, yeah. And you do end up becoming quite like proud of your college and you do like, um, yeah, everyone, um, even if you weren't sure about your college to start with, uh, the majority of people do sort of cut, become and enjoy, uh, come to really support their college and really like it. 
Yeah, that's definitely true. Thank you so much, Alex. I think yeah, everyone, you can't imagine being at a different college. You know, you can't imagine being anywhere else. Absolutely. Um, I've made a note of a few of the questions that I saw that came into the Q&A box that I think I can just quickly answer. There was a question about UCAS references. Um, so there are some sort of planned proposed changes. UCAS is going through a sort of... Um, uh, what's the word, a, like proposal period where they're considering like a review period, I guess. Um, so when we have an update about the changes to teacher references and personal statements as well, um, then that information will be available on the um, on the prospective applicant pages on the on the university website. Um, so yeah, that, that's a sort of uh, UCAS decision that, that we will sort of respond to um, when that happens. Uh, in terms of, there were a couple questions about um, like qualifications, GCSEs and A-levels. So I saw a question about, um, are there any like GCSE requirements? So we don't have any minimum GCSE requirements here at Cambridge. We, um, we do have, so our entrance, i.e. successful applicants, excuse me, um, people who get uh, who get uh, in and are studying here, they usually have a high proportion of seven, eights and nines um, at GCSE, but we look uh, during the application process, we look at an individual applicant's um, GCSE grades in context, and that goes to that's go that's the same for um, every element of the application um, process. All the elements of of what you submit to us, we look at that within context, and we use um, contextual information, uh, contextual data. I'll share a a, a web page that's uh, relevant. To that in just a second. Um, we use contextual data like your school's performance, um, your, your local area and its participation um, in, in higher education, i.e. how many people um, sort of go on to, to university from there. So we have lots of this sort of socio-demographic data that we use. And you also will be able to tell us other contextual information as well about your educational and personal history. We have a particular form for that. It's actually called the ECF, the Extenuating Circumstances of Form. Um, I can share the, the, the web page relevant to that as well in the chat. So to answer the question, I kind of went off on a tangent there talking about contextual um, information. But yeah, GCSEs are looked at, but they're looked at in the context um, of everything else, because we understand that uh, post-16 exams are usually a, a better performance indicator. Um, but we do take everything into context. The other question was about A-levels. Um, and that sort of choosing between taking three or four. Um, for some people, taking four A-levels makes sense because their fourth A-level would be further maths, which is either you know, a highly recommended subject or a required subject for the course that they're applying to at Cambridge. For those sorts of questions about whether your subjects um, are required or recommended, i.e. essential or just desirable, um, there's lots of useful information on the course pages. I will share that in the in the chat as well. Um, what I would want to say is if you scroll all the way down to a gray box on the main university course web pages, um, you'll find um, really helpful information about sort of the proportion of applicants who um, secured a place, so successful applicants who studied XYZ subjects um, and what grades on average they got as well. So it's a really useful uh, piece of information, a sort of snapshot of recent years data of you know uh, in 2018 2019 I think is, is most of the data where, where we got that from um so I'll share those in the chat now um just looking if there are any other questions that I could answer oh there was one that I wanted to throw back to to, to you guys on, on the panel it's about sort of transitioning from school to university and how you found that and how learning at school is different from learning at, at university so yeah Alex do you want to go first for that Yep, so there's obviously a massive difference. You're not living, living at home with your family or carers. Um, you're, co you're coming to your own uh, sort of accommodation. That's a big change in itself. But as in teaching, um, you still could say you have lessons. Um, basically, you ha you'll have lectures for most courses um, and a timetable for those throughout the term. Uh, although those tend to be uh, only for between two to six hours most in a day, uh, depending on your subject. Some will have very few lectures. Um, but the a very Cambridge thing is um, supervision. So for, for each paper, uh, typically you'll have so many hours of supervision throughout the term. Um, most supervisors do these on a regular slot, either each week or each fortnight. Um, and so you do learn to become quite organized and most students have a calendar um, sort of to 
organised um, where your lectures are, what super, where you, when your supervisions are, um, and also there'll be um, other sort of, uh, you'll want to fit extracurriculars around them sometimes in the afternoons, uh, Wednesday afternoons for university sports, uh, for example. You do sort of, um, certain things are very more flexible, such as some supervisors will allow you to sort of pick different slots. So you can be, it's a lot more organization and the emphasis, whereas at school you'd may, might have a teacher chasing up on you if you hadn't done the work. Um, here, it's a lot more emphasis on you to do the work. Um, although you're, you have a director of studies who's typically based at your college, um, who will be keeping an eye and making sure you're doing the work and um, keeping up to scratch on that. Also, whilst I'm mentioning sort of director of studies, I, it's also, I think it's just a good idea to throw into the fact you also have a tutor in college. Um, so everyone has a tutor uh, who's basically totally unrelated to your subject um, and is there for pastoral support. So um, if you have any issues, anything's happened back home, uh, if you need any extra support, they're, they're an, another person in college to support you. Um, yeah, so there's the teaching varies. It's it's different. Um, you still have the same amount of work, if not a little bit more, um, but you just sort of work it round um, and you have a bit more flexibility. Excellent. Well, great advice. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. And colleges also have like health and well-being teams, like college nurses, college counsellors. Um, so you really do have a really rich network of support here. And you also have a great thing of peer-to-peer -peer support. So when I was a student, I was a welfare rep. So that's something Sarah mentioned before. So yeah, it all sort of links in together as well as your, your individual tutor. Um, Amir, you had your hand up. Off you go. Um, yeah, so I was just going to add... Uh... Just at university, this is probably, this doesn't just apply to Cambridge, it's any university is, there's probably a lot of increased independence compared to uh, schools. So like uh, you'll be responsible for managing your own time and uh, just uh, doing uh, the workload, which is obviously there's, uh, it's quite intense in Cambridge. Uh, but there's also a lot of critical, uh, critical, critical thinking in, in the work that you do, whereas like, as a school, uh, it's probably it doesn't probably take take you that much uh, to do the work. But uh, here you've got the problem sheet, and you have to spend hours and hours on it. I mean, it depends on the subject as well. But for something like computer science, uh, you you would expect to get a stock on a question, uh, and you just have to like not give up. Uh, so it, there's a lot of like work is intense and also there's the assessment methods are different to school so whereas uh, in a school you had a lot of individual work you might end up doing a project at, at university so you need to like um, yeah be able to like work as a team and uh, yeah so it, it, there's a lot that's different to to school yeah, absolutely. That sort of problem solving on your own, but also in those small groups as part of uh, supervisions and, and uh, example classes, I think maybe uh, is another way that you do that. Yes, Sarah, what did you have to add? Yeah, I was just going to say in terms of uh, humanity subjects, especially and the content that you're studying, I found, whereas at A level, I was just kind of reading textbooks and then regurgitating it, you get to actually engage with primary text. Like I'm, I can read what the scholars I was um, learning about a couple of years ago actually wrote. And I think that's one of the main things with university is your opinion matters and you can engage with, um, especially in theology and philosophy and history with scholars who have been thinking about these ideas for hundreds of years, but what you also have to say really matters. And that's quite um, that's quite a cool thing about university and you're able to form opinions. I know I've changed my mind about a lot of things or I've been confirmed in what I've believed before. Um, so it's not just memorizing it, it's also just trying to critically engage with stuff. Absolutely. And um, when I talk to supervisors, who are the people that lead these supervisions, the, the academics, they often say that they learn a lot from the supervisions in the sense that they learn from their students because they have fresh perspectives on these texts. They have been studying for so long and you need that fresh take sometimes um, and just someone else's idea thrown into the mix. So, yeah, I think it's really rewarding and really exciting to be part of that sort of process. Um, Richard, what did you have to add? Uh, very similar to what um, Sarah said, but I mean, even from like the STEM perspective, the, the problems you do at A-level um, are very kind of routine. I remember like, especially in chemistry, when you're learning like the to 
basically when you're trying to get an A star, you're pretty much learning marker schemes. You're like, they want this point. It's very routine questions. You know, they want this sort of these three points when they ask the question. Uh, whereas um, the supervision questions you get here um, in across the subjects, like you kind of, you actually kind of have to think about them and you sort of, they're not just routine questions and that's more interesting. So, you know, you might spend, you can't really bang through the three questions in about 10 minutes. You, it's, it, you, you sit there sometimes spending an hour trying to figure out a problem, um, which if that's what you want to do, that's great, which, you know, it's what I want to do is what I like doing. So, you know, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you everyone so much. Um, I'm conscious of the time. We've got just under five minutes left. Um, I wanted to respond to a question um, about reapplying. So uh, reapplying after rejection. And the question was, why is it not recommended to reapply um, to the same college? So we kind of have a blanket policy here at St. John's um, that when you're making a reapplication, we would advise you that you would reapply and completely make a fresh start. So applying to a new college, because it's the experience that that we've seen that um, it, it's it's rarely the case that uh, reapplying to the same college after rejection leads to a successful outcome because you'll essentially be having the same sort of experience. You'll be having the same, um, they're often the same interviewers. Um, so your previous experience of having um, uh, having applied to that particular college, it tends not to be beneficial to you at all. And it's, it's not sort of a reflection of anyone's particular um, uh, application that they previously made it's it's just a it's just a sort of a, a general policy that that we advise um for those for those candidates who who are looking to reapply um but that's definitely a question that we can discuss further over email so i think that's a good point for me to just pop in the in the chat box um my email address um which i think will be really helpful you've probably already seen it because i've been emailing you all of the links to the the webinars and the reminders to register so it's just access officer at joh.cam.ac.uk um and if you did have any uh, additional questions that are sort of subject specific i'm more than happy to pass those on to the students that were here this evening um so that they can answer those and then i'll, I'll, I'll feed that back to you um yeah the, the only thing that remains for me to say is thank you so much uh, to all of the students here who have taken their time to come and uh, reflect on their experiences applying, reflect on their time here so far. Um, it's been just, yeah, fantastic to hear your, your advice, your thoughts, your, your perspectives. I really couldn't have run any session like this without you. Obviously, um, you're such an important part of, of what we do with the webinar series and um, our outreach and, and admissions events more generally. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you so much. And thank you also to the uh, attendees um, who have come and also taken the time and, and listened and engaged really well with some excellent questions. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question this evening, then please do send me an email. I'd be more than happy to um, to yeah get back to you with a with a full answer after the session. I'll send you a, um, a sort of wrap up follow up email tomorrow with all of those links that I was posting in the chat frantically uh, throughout. So if you didn't manage to, to sort of make a note of any of those links or copy and paste them, then don't worry, I will send you all of them in an email. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.